Selma Hayek has a plan to save the world, and it's actually pretty damn good. So there I was watching the movie Bliss, which I honestly think gets harped on a little bit too much, but that's besides the point. <laughs> One scene in particular really stood out to me, and this isn't a spoiler, by the way, but it's when Salma's character explains how they were able to turn Earth into a utopia. She chalked it up to three things, automation, asteroid mining, and synthetic biology. Basically, what went down on this utopian Earth was these big tech guys were able to start mining asteroids in space, which brought mountains of new money back down to Earth. And then the guy who owned the asteroid mining company decided to start giving away all of this free money, leaving every single person a base salary of $500,000 a year. Then with automation and AI, the robots started to do all of the boring and tedious tasks, giving people the freedom of time to explore their passions, science, art, whatever they wanted, which led to advancements in synthetic biology that was able to repair and restore the Earth back to a healthy and sustainable planet. Now, for an extremely poorly rated movie, I think this plan was not half bad. And it's funny that it's coming from Amazon Prime, because let's see if Mr. Jeff Bezos himself is going to start handing out free money anytime soon. <laughs> but I do want to dive into Salma's plan a bit and some of the real world applications of it, shall we? Right out between Mars and Jupiter lies the asteroid belt, an area of our solar system containing millions of asteroids of all shapes and sizes. These are more than just huge pieces of rock, and some of them contain more gold, iron, nickel, and cobalt than the entirety of our current global metal reserve. Now, this is huge because it's been predicted that with our current consumption rates, we could completely run out of some of these metals by the year 2067. Now, that's obviously not good because we use them to make cars, cameras, phones, equipment, you get the gist. But thankfully, we have mountains of this stuff relatively close to us, and whoever's the first person to go get it is in for a massive payday. There are three asteroids in particular that scientists are really interested in. The first two are 1986 DA and 2016 ED85. Taking into account the market deflation that would happen, bringing all of these metals back, these two asteroids are worth about $11.65 trillion each, pulling in a collective $466 billion a year over a 50-year mining period. Which is insane, but it's absolutely nothing compared to the massive 226 Six kilometer wide asteroid 16 Psyche. And if we're able to bring her back down to Earth, including market deflation, she would be worth 10,000 quadrillion dollars. Now, to put that into perspective, the entire global economy is only worth 100 trillion dollars. Now, imagine the impact that, as Selma put it, these mountains of new money could have on the world as a whole. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. Well, even if we were able to bring in 10,000 quadrillion dollars of new money back down to Earth, it would probably be hoarded by a small number of billionaires. Well, I guess they wouldn't be billionaires anymore. They would be trillionaires or quadrillionaires, but I get the point. A major factor of Salma's story is that Mr. Asteroid Miner decided to redistribute his wealth, giving everyone a base salary of $500,000 a year. It was this payment that was instrumental in giving them the freedom of time to focus on whatever they wanted, which is where universal basic income enters the chat. Now, I'm going to do a quick disclaimer here, because anytime I've ever talked about UBI, I get flooded with a bunch of this is communism comments. A universal basic income is not communism, and capitalism itself does not rely on the existence of poor people. Even the father of capitalism said the only point in capitalism is reinvesting in the lowest class of people, lifting them up so they have the money to continue stimulating the economy or something like that. <laughs> Universal basic income works exactly how it sounds. It is an equal and unconditional payment sent to every single person that is enough to cover all of your basic living needs. It wouldn't matter if you were a CEO, a single mother, or a college student. Everyone would be entitled to the exact same amount every single month. Now, I think where people get mixed up with communism here is this is a promise of equal opportunity, not equal outcome. There are still going to be people who have a lot more money than others, but a UBI just ensures that no matter someone's circumstance, they won't be living in poverty. You can still get a job or two, or you could decide to focus on your artistic interests, start a business, or focus on your education without ever having to worry about putting food on the table or a roof over your head. On top of eliminating poverty, every time a UBI has been tested anywhere, studies show that it boosts individual happiness, productivity, health, school attendance, and trust in social institutions, which is at an all-time low right now, while also reducing crime. But most importantly, it raises the quality of life for everyone. And with 34% of all current jobs 
predicted to be wiped out due to automation and artificial intelligence by the year 2040. It will severely lower the stress of that on everyone. Speaking of automation and artificial intelligence, I think our generation was raised on so much young adult dystopian fiction that we've almost been conditioned to think that building robots and artificial intelligence is some recipe for disaster. And one day this evil AI overlord will turn against us and wipe humanity off the face of the earth. But. What if it's awesome? <laughs> Sentient artificial intelligence at this point is completely science fiction. No one has any idea whether or not we'll actually be able to create a conscious living machine. But what we do know is that we will be able to create extremely intelligent machines that are able to analyze mountains of data and advise us on the best course of action. There are two ways that I like to think about this, how it's going to affect society as a whole, and then how it's going to affect you as the individual. In 2014, Deep Knowledge Ventures, a venture capitalist firm focused on regenerative medicine, announced that they had appointed an AI named Vital to its board. Vital allegedly makes investment recommendations by analyzing huge amounts of data regarding the financial situation, clinical trials, and intellectual property of prospective companies. And just like the other five human board members, Vital gets a vote on whether or not the firm makes an investment in a specific company. While at the time, this may have been more of a PR stunt than anything else, with what we know now about things like ChatGPT, I think we can both agree that this seems like something that is going to be extremely common in a few years. And personally, I would probably trust a computer algorithm to make an investment decision for me more than a human. So why not give it a vote in something like politics as well? Because computers can't have ulterior motives, but humans can. Now, there's this great TED talk on here called The Internet of Everything by Tom Morin. I'll link it down in the description. But he talks about how our smart devices are going to evolve in the future. And I'm not going to get into the whole thing, but he basically talks about how with the use of AI, all of our smart devices will be connected together, helping us streamline our entire day. It will be like your personal AI assistant who wakes you up, starts your coffee, organizes your calendar, and does all of the tedious mundane tasks for you, freeing up more of your time. If you've used ChatGPT, you know how helpful it can be. That's why it was the fastest growing app of all time. Now imagine when it's like 10 to 100 times more advanced, you can speak to it, and it's woven into all of the smart devices in your home. It's gonna be a lot more like Tony Stark's Jarvis or Friday, and less like Megan or something. <laughs> so far, we've mined asteroids, eliminated poverty, and now we have computer programs helping us solve all of our societal problems and personal AI assistance helping us out in our day-to-day -day life whenever we need it. I'm starting to think that Selma was onto something, but there is one missing piece of her plan, synthetic biology. One of the coolest technological inventions of the 21st century so far is CRISPR gene editing. And I feel like we get caught up so much talking about the ethical implications of rewriting human DNA and guy selling designer babies that we forget that we can also rewrite the DNA of other living organisms like plants. One of my favorite examples is the scientists who are working on taking the bioluminescence gene that makes certain marine animals glow in the dark and then giving it to plants. So that one day in the future, instead of all of our streets being lined with street lights, they would be lined with glow-in-the-dark trees. Now on top of that, imagine what will happen when we can re-engineer these trees to absorb 10 or 100 times more carbon dioxide than they currently do, and then we plant millions of them. There are also teams working on engineering plants that have deeper and stronger roots, so they can pull more water and nutrients from the soil in hot, dry places like Africa, and engineering microbes that we can place in water that will pull chemicals and other pollutants out of our reserves and oceans. The list goes on and on, and I know it's not the silver bullet to solving climate change, but mixing technology with nature and then using it to heal our planet seems like a pretty good and cool idea to me. Because it's important to remember that we actually have all of the technology and ideas needed to fix a lot of the problems that we currently have on our planet, and the future doesn't need to be some dark dystopian Hunger Games Terminator 1984 nuclear fallout-esque thing. It might actually be really cool, and there are tons of people out there right now in every single one of these industries working towards making this become a reality. And maybe you don't trust the billionaires or the global elites or whatever you want to call them to help make this a reality. But guess what? 80% of my audience is between the ages of 18 and 24, including myself. And in the next 15 to 30 years, it's going to be our generation who's making the rules. So if any of you become trillionaires by then, you better start redistributing some of that money so we can make the rest of the things on this list come true. That is unless some of these billionaires become immortal which is something else that they're working on. And if you want to check that out, you can click on the video next to me.